Amadeus Creative is in conjunction with Seleucia University presents Conversations on the Law. Greetings, my dear friends. This is our video number three out of three. It's a privilege to be back and to share in this third conversation on the law. And as we go into this conversation, we are building from what we have discussed. We had uh, five questions, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the first question that we looked at was um, who makes the rules? Number two, where are the sources of the, these rules and regulations? Number three, we also looked at uh, to whom do they apply? Now, there are two questions that we're going to address that remained in that particular series. Um, question number four, do we have to obey these rules? And question number five, what if we want to change them? How do we go about changing these rules? Now, before we go into obedience, um, obeying these laws and complying with the laws, um, as our custom is, why don't you take time to pray together and invite the Lord's presence? Let us pray. Kind of gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of giving us this moment to have a conversation on the law. And we want to look at obedience to the laws. Some of these laws, as we are going to learn, dear Lord, they are not so just, they are not so fair. Some are outdated. But as far as your laws are concerned, they are immemorial, they are timeless, and they need no amendments. Dear Lord, teach us how to distinguish between these two. This has been our prayer of faith. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, um... As we go into this conversation, I'm sure by now you, you have memorized the acronym POG, Peace, Order, and Good Governance. This is what the legislature is tasked with. And above all, as far as uh, the judiciary is concerned, it has a responsibility towards justice. It has to ensure that justice is done and justice is delivered at all times. So, um... The issue is even when the legislature has done a good job in ensuring that it enacts laws that see to it that peace, order, and good governance um, are delivered on, even where justice has been uh, delivered on, it is still possible that you are going to have bad laws being enacted. And when these laws are enacted, they are going to be enforced by the courts. And when they are enforced by the courts, this is where now one would uh, then have to deal with the moral dilemma. Should you obey these laws or should you not obey these laws? Because the issue of whether they are just or not now speaks to the content of the law, the aesthetics of the law. These are some of the things that one has to look at. And this debate on whether to obey or not to obey the law is a very old debate. And it became so heated in the time of the 1940s when the Nazi government was gassing up the Jews. And it was a legal system that was doing this and it was enacting those laws. Now, because of that, there came a scenario where the school that had been there, there was a school of the naturalists. The naturalists are those who, um, let me say, are moralists as it were. Not particularly moralists at all times. But in that whole bracket is the bracket of moralists. And then the positivists, there is the other bracket. These are the ones who say, as Maduke has said, the law has to be measured by its enforcement. It is the enforcement by the state that distinguishes the law from the moral norms. So these are the positivists. Now we want to go back and look at this debate before we answer yes or no on whether people should obey the laws or they should not obey the laws. So what do these naturalists say? And who are they, some of these naturalists? Now, as um, Penner, I think Penner says in, 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 in the book, um, I think it was a 2008 publication. This is what Penner has to say. Naturalist theories cover a vast spectrum from the Old Testament to the present day. But its classical form is uh, situated at around the 18th century. That's when most of these naturalists uh, would be found. But naturalists go as far back as the Old Testament. And I'm, um, I would have to then say I, I must be a naturalist because I believe the laws of the Old Testament are still binding. 
They were not nailed to the cross. They are binding. Because if they had to be changed, then, <laughs> then there would be something wrong with them. The one who enacted them. So if God is perfect and God is all-knowing, there is no way he's going to make a law that is imperfect. But that is not the issue for now. Let's engage on that discussion on another day. The issue that we want to look at is, there is the moral nature of the law. And one of these uh, proponents uh, of um, the naturalist law was um, St. Augustine of Hippo. This gentleman, this St. Augustine of Hippo, he builds uh, what um, Penner has referred to as the law has basically two areas. Number one, it's proper purposes. It must have a purpose that it fulfills. What are those purposes? I'm going to refer to the previous uh, sessions so that we have a clear understanding. So the purpose of the law is to deliver on peace, order, and governance. So those are the proper purposes. And then there are also the limitations on the obligation to obey the law. So where the law does not deliver on peace, order, and governance, the limitations begin to creep in. So what did this gentleman say? This Saint Augustine of Hippo. He basically proposed that there are two levels, there are two layers to the law. The first layer is the law as it is the law of God. And he used this Latin term, lex eterna, as in the eternal law. This is how I got to memorize it. Lex eterna. It's eternal. It doesn't change. It speaks to the will of God. And it is the highest law, the highest moral code. And after it comes the laws as they are posited. That's the positive law. The laws as they are enacted by the state, as they are enacted by the legislature. And this is what he referred to as the lex temporalis. So you will notice the law is lex. Number one, lex eterna, eternal law, the will of God. Lex temporalis, temporalis sounds like temporal, passing, fleeting, can change. These are the laws that we have. And he says the distinction between the two is that the first one is the will of God. And the second one is the will of the legislature. And what is it meant to, de to, to deter? It is meant to deter vices and bad decisions only. Now he then ends on this. This is the statement that he has come to be known for. The statement is lex in justa, non est lex. Ish. It's a difficult one, but you just have to memorize it. Lex in justa, non est lex. What this simply means is an unjust law is no law. So some have then used the words of uh, St. Augustine of Hippo to simply say, therefore, there is no law at all as long as it is unjust. But that's not what he meant. What he simply means is a law that is not as per the will of God is not just. Not that it is not a law. It still remains a law because it has been approved as such as a lex temporalis. It does not take anything away from it being a lex temporalis, a posited law. But as far as its justice is concerned, it's being just. That is debatable. So what uh, he simply says is, in as much as all these laws are designed to make sure that they deter vice and ill conduct, if a person is bound and observes lex eterna, the laws of God, the Ten Commandments in their totality, you will find that your scope of operation may be way above what the laws of the land would demand. You generally operate above all those because lex temporalis, is already covered in Romans chapter 13, obey the civil authority. So this is what St. Augustine of Hippo basically said as a naturalist. Obey the laws of God, you will not have a problem with the laws of the land. Let us look at one other um, naturalist who then spoke about these, St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas, there are, there are quite a number of schools and institutions that have even been named about, uh, after him. I, I know that in Bulawayo there is a school in Kumalo, that's St. Thomas Aquinas. Yes, St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, he was uh, a theologian, just like St. Augustine of Hippo, who was uh, stationed in Africa at some point. Now, with St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, besides being a theologian, he was a student of the law. 
St. Thomas builds from what Augustine of Hippo had already advanced. Augustine of Hippo had said the law is split into two, Lex Eterna and Lex Temporalis. Lex Eterna, the will of God. And Lex Temporalis, the positive law, the law as legislated. So Thomas then says, you know what? It will be very difficult for us to establish what the law is, the will of God is. So in order for us to understand the first uh, parameter of the law, we need to appreciate that the law as the Lex Eterna has to be further um, subcategorized into A, Lex Divina. Lex Divina is the divine law as we find it in the scriptures. Make it a habit to consider your scriptures every day. It will do you good. So the law as it is in the scriptures, that is the Lex Divina. So we need to appreciate the will of God as it is expressed in the scriptures, in the Bible. And uh, the will of God, of course, will go, of course, as uh, St. Thomas spoke, he spoke to the Christian faith. Though, so if, if you are not Christian, you still say the will of God as expressed in the Torah. So the will of God is going to be found in various forms of scripture, but the particular emphasis and context that Thomas speaks to, he speaks to the will of God as expressed in the Bible. The next section of Lex Eterna is the will of God as expressed in nature. And he referred to this as Lex Naturalis. So let us go back where we had Lex Eterna. It will branch into Lex Divina and Lex Naturalis. So Lex Divina is the word of God as expressed in scripture. Lex Naturalis it is the word of God as observed by man through nature and the order of things. We are generally an observant people. We look at how things are done and we replicate them and we improve them. So we also learn from how God operates and how God has set systems in place. So as people learn from these systems, guess what? They come up with their own ways of doing things. Now, uh, St. Augustine, said the second section of the law is the lex temporalis, which is the posited law, the law as it is given by the legislature. Now, this um, section, you know, um, Thomas chooses to use a different set. And he says, of course, yes, 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 this is the lex temporalis. It's okay. But it is not just restricted to addressing the vices, and addressing poor judgment only. So we cannot say the law is meant to arrest offenders because there are laws that are good in and of themselves that have nothing to do with arresting anyone. You know? Think about it. The other week we we're talking about um, the marriage law, the African customary law. Is that uh, a, a law that is meant to arrest anyone? Not at all. So... This, this, this is an interesting thing that we have to appreciate, that the laws are not always meant to catch offenders. There are some laws that are meant to um, make things better, to help um, us have a better sense of things and a better life. Now, um, Penner even gives an example of um, the, 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 the statutory fees that we pay towards processing of documents, towards uh, registrations, towards keeping our registrations current. Those are some of the laws that we have. These laws are positive. And so he says, we need to then appreciate that it cannot just be lex temporalis that is in the second bracket. So we need to act add lex humana. So this is the human positive law. These are good laws that human beings decide on. So he basically says, Augustine of Hippo has come up with two sections of the law. Section number one, Lex Eterna. Section number two, Lex Temporalis. So he then says, let's just do away with Lex Eterna and instead have two subcategories in that section. We're going to come up with Lex Divina and Lex um, Naturalis. Now, as far as Lex uh, Temporalis, let's couple it with Lex humana, because lex temporalis is a prohibitive law, as it were. But we want to appreciate that the law is not always prohibitive. 
it can also enable people to do things. Just like Section 134, it, it, it says the parliament can then delegate to a subordinate authority to make the laws. So that kind of delegation would be a lex humana. It's not a lex temporalis. It is not prohibiting. It enables people to act. Now, the constitution, the judiciary has um, a responsibility of protecting the freedoms of the people. What are some of those freedoms? The freedom to contract. The freedom, of to, the freedom to contract is a positive law. It says individuals can go into contracts as equal parties. So that is what the law is. So this we need to wrap our heads around and say these two gentlemen that we have identified and pulled out, these are gentlemen besides the Old Testament prophets. These are the gentlemen who speak during the 18th century, who speak to the law and they say, as far as the law, it must be founded on the word of God. This is uh, something that has been considered to be out of date nowadays. People are thinking, um, ah, this Christianity thing, ah, this Bible thing. They're no longer interested in that. They have since moved on. But um, that's where I have remained. I... I still rub shoulders with the likes of St. Augustine and uh, St. Uh, uh, Thomas and still insist. So Lucy University as an institution is a naturalist <laughs> institution because they still believe the law has a natural and a moral content, a moral aesthetic that is still part of the law. So, well, as far as the laws of the land are concerned, they may be different. They may have separate expectations. But those are still fundamental to human existence. That was the belief that at that time. But the law has since moved. The naturalists say, no, 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 no. Maybe there is a procedural element to the law. And one of those who pushed for this procedural element is Professor Lorne Fuller. I'm sure you remember in our first video, we did refer to Professor Lorne Fuller. The one who said definitions of law we have in unwanted abundance. But it is the definitions of morality and the law that seem not to be understood, especially the last one. So Fuller now gives more detail on the procedural law. Now let us hear what he has to say on the procedural law. Professor Lon Fuller builds from uh, St. Augustine and um, uh, St. Thomas. Now, while St. Augustine simply said an unjust law is not the law, basically just do away with it. The, the moral obligation to obey does not exist where there is no justice. There, there is no moral obligation. As far as uh, St. Augustine is concerned, he's clear-cut. But um, when you come to St. Thomas Aquinas, he is not as clear-cut. He says, if um, the law is unjust, you want to strike a balance and say, there are some laws that do not clash with the will of God, but they're just unfair. These laws that are unfair, you want to balance and say, my uh, disobedience to this law, does it not tear down the whole legal system? If it is an inconvenience, bear the inconvenience for the, for the sake of the legal system. There are some things that are a nuisance, they are frustration, they are an inconvenience, but they are still the law. They, they don't take anything away from you. They, they, they do not make you violate the laws of God. If there is no clash with the laws of God, surely, surely, just go on with it. Now, for I'm setting this as a background as we go into the procedural morality of the law. Now, um, Professor Fuller now comes up with an eight test, an eight step test that gives all these um, ideas. And he says the bottom end is the duty end. And the top end of this test is the aspiration end. So let's say he's basically coming up with a test word which is out of eight. So if you pass all eight, then you have reached what all would aspire. This is the satisfaction, the, 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 the level of self-satisfaction. Now, if you meet um, some of these, you would have met the basic needs, the duty aspect. So you may not pass all of them, but should you pass all of them, that is the ideal. That is the utopia, but we should, we should still strive for it and still deliver on it. So what are some of these things that Fuller now gives? He says, if you are to fail all these, then automatically you cease to be a legal system that should be recognized. 
and a, a system that should make laws that should be obeyed. But those who are going to make the laws that should be obeyed, surely they may miss it here and there, but they must strive towards meeting all the eight aspects. Now, the test, the first test, let's look at this. They're very interesting. Test number one, failure to establish rules at all, leading to absolute anarchy, where you have a situation where everyone does as they please. There is no law. If we have a system that fails at test number one, we we do not even go on to measure it on test two to eight. If you do not have any laws enacted, you cannot say you are a legal system. It's that simple. It's that simple. So your primary duty as a legal system, that has to be obeyed. That has to be recognized as such. You need to have laws and regulations. So we still go back to that issue of um, laws and regulations need to be enacted by a legislature. So where there is no legislature, there are no laws. There is no system. Test number two. What do we have here? Failure to make rules public to those who require them and are required to observe these. So you have a situation where, um, allow me to go into a company setup. Uh, In a company setup, uh, regulations are being made by the directors. They are not availed on the company website. They are not shared with the employees on the memo. They are not shared by public announcement. The employees will only learn that there is a new regulation when they come in to claim a benefit. Then all of a sudden you are told, no, that benefit is no longer there. We decided that uh, this particular benefit is now scrapped off. It no longer applies. So in a situation where the laws are there, but they are not known, they are not published, such a setup is going to result in uh, a system that fails to demand obedience. Now, let's go back and we say when parliament um, passes a law, the law must be assented to by the president, the legislature and the president. When they are done with that, the laws must then be gazetted. I think it was in the previous video that I referred to Kobia 2019 as having been gazetted on the 15th of November 2019, if I'm not mistaken. So this is what uh, Fuller then says. Every institution, every system that demands obedience must have laws that are known, must have laws that are published, and they must be accessible in other words. And number three, even as we go through the process of publishing these laws, these laws have to be published prospectively not retroactively. So prospectively means going forward, not going backwards. Now let's go back to Halo and Khan. Now we're beginning to apply these concepts and link them. Remember what they said about judicial presidents. They said, we don't want to have a situation whereby rights that have been what? Have been uh, received. Rights that have been enjoyed are dislocated. They are taken away. So it has to affect affect people going forward. You cannot say those who have enjoyed this right find themselves having to lose the right because we have decided to take the the law backwards. The law must go forward at all times. So those who have benefited from the system cannot be uh, disenfranchised. They cannot be, um, you know, find themselves losing out because somehow the laws have changed. That which was proper yesterday has become evil today. I know I'm using moral terms, but the issue is the law must apply going forward, not backwards. Forward, not backwards. Now let's look at number four. Failure to make comprehensible rules. You know, these are rules that are not clear to the reader. They do not know what is expected of them. You know, rules must be clear. And unfortunately, the law is not clear itself. You're going to find yourself having to get someone who has studied the law or a lawyer to explain the law to you. 
I wish the law was simplified so that everyone and every Tom, Dick, and Harry would understand what the law is. And, um, well, like it or not, that's the jargon of the discipline. But that does not necessarily mean it is not clear. The expectations must be clear. Do not take someone else's property. If you do so, you're going to be sent to jail. Do not um, have uh, sexual relations with someone who has not consented. If you do so, you're going to be charged with rape and you'll go to jail. That is clear. It is known. These are the first four and I wish for us to take a breather at this point and then we'll come back at number five. But what I want us to reflect on, what we have covered so far is that the law must be enacted. Number two, the law must be made public and gazetted. Number three, it must be prospective. It must go forward. Number four, it must be comprehensible. It must be certain, just like the custom. Remember the four items of the custom? It must be certain. It must be comprehensible. We must understand what the law is. Before we move to item number five, I hope you're getting these and you're sinking in. At item number five, he says we need to make rules and the rules must not contradict each other. Because when rules contradict each other, people would not know which one to go with. So in a situation where um, the, the, there's a conflict of rules, the law needs to be reordered so that we do not have a conflict of laws. So where there is a conflict of laws, this is the principle that applies. The superior act will take precedence. Where the acts are at the same level, the later act is the one that is usually considered to be the current one and must take precedence. So ideally, the, the laws that uh, would have become outdated ought to be formally annulled. You know, they have to be struck off officially. You should not have a situation where we're just going to assume that the latest is the one that should have been assumed to have been, um, you know, taken the place of the previous law. Ideally, a system must always have a situation where there are no conflicts. So it must always be clear so that we don't have a situation whereby one day there is this law, tomorrow there is another law. The laws should not contradict each other. There must be a synergy. There must be a symbiotic relationship. So the law must, number one, as we have mentioned, uh, I think it was section 134. As far as the statutory instruments, they must be in tandem with the parent act. As far as the acts are concerned, they must also be in tandem with the constitution. This kind of relationship, this is what we said is being ultra virus. All these must be intra virus. So where they have a conflict, they are ultra virus. Where they are in tandem, this is where they are intra virus. And I made the illustration, I said they must be in virus. Go in via the law. Ultra outside, like, you know, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. So in, in a setup where the laws are contradicting each other, that is not a legal system that delivers. It should not demand obedience if it cannot come up with the regulations like that. Surely, it simply means you are confused. Well, why should people follow you if you are confused? And number six, here's the other thing. Do not impose the requirements which make it impossible for people to comply. Now, let me give a typical example, an easy one. Number one, you cannot have a disciplinary hearing where you're summoning people to the head office in Harare and you know they are stationed in Bulawayo or in Cheredzi and you want them to be at the head office tomorrow by 8 o'clock for a disciplinary hearing and you're sending notice at midnight the day before. You're making it impossible for it to be complied with. So the order makes it impossible. So where it's impossible to be complied with, that is to be a law. Who is going to take you serious? Who's going to take you serious? And um, that besides, let's stretch it a bit. Now you have a scenario whereby um, the poverty datum line, um, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, usually uh, in the past, it used to be the consumer price index, a company, a family, of about, um, is it five or so, be needing, was needing about $500, close to 500 United States dollars. So in a situation where the 
consumer price index is such that you will need about 500 US dollars for you to earn a living. Now you have a scenario whereby uh, the state would give taxes, uh, levy taxes, such that a, a person who is earning is already earning below the poverty, poverty datum line. They're earning around $200. And you already have a family of five. Now of this family of five, children are already going to school. So the taxes that are going to be imposed upon such a citizen, they tend to weigh too heavy on them. And this is where now it uh, sort of pushes them um, towards a difficulty or an impossibility. So you may find that some people who are supposed to be uh, returning their taxes faithfully are not going to return those taxes because they cannot afford them. It's an impossibility. And uh, some of those people are going to go and uh, purchase things uh, because they cannot purchase them within the country and um, because prices are ever on the rise. And um, you find a situation where, whereby you go to the shops, the cross rates, you are earning at um, uh, 1 is to 80, but the price is already priced at 1 is to 20. So if you are transacting, you are transacting at a deficit of $40 already. So prices are already set against you. So what are most of these people going to do? You find them having to resort to buying things across the border. This is where you're going to have people now um, trafficking goods. Your Omalaija. Those people are trafficking goods because the law has been designed in such a way, the economy is uh, designed in such a way that it doesn't favor compliance. It makes it almost impossible for someone to earn at $80 but spend at $120. How do you account for the difference? How do you then uh, make up for the difference? So most people are not going to be able to earn a living. So it becomes difficult because of that exorbitance in terms of prices. And at number seven, you should not have rules that are changing too frequently. Today, this is the law. Tomorrow, this is the law. Next week, this is the law. It becomes so difficult for people to even keep up. You know, you can't keep up. Today, there's a charge for this. Tomorrow, there's a charge for that. Prices have been reviewed to this. Taxes have been reviewed to that. We need to have at least a foreseeable future so that people can plan their business ahead of time. They need notices. You cannot have a situation whereby everything is new every day. And then at number eight, the last one. Now, um, there's a discontinuity between the stated content of the rules and their administration in practice. Hmm. Let's simplify this. You find a situation where the law is the law for the poor and it is not the law for the rich. So those who make the law seem to make the law, but they are exempt from complying with it. So they are making the law for us so that we are the ones who should, who should comply with it. So when people find themselves in that kind of a setup, guess what they say? Why should we comply with it? Because we're poor? Why should we comply? Because we're black? Because we're white? You know, then people begin to think, if it doesn't apply to you, then it is not good law at all. If it is good law, then it is good enough for you. So this is where those who are in authority, those who make the laws, must then lead by example. They need to be the ones to be seen to be complying with the law. I think I think the the president of Zimbabwe actually came up some time in the in the news and said, you know, there shall be a need for those who are in public office to declare their assets and, and account for how they they, they 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 acquired those assets, because if they they are not going to be seen to be accounting for that, how then are people going to become accountable? How will corruption die? So this is where now you have your anti corruption commissions. All those kind of commissions are coming in so as to ensure that the laws and practice are in tandem. They work together. So what have we covered so far in the last four? Number five, make rules that do not contradict each other. Number six, make rules that do not make it impossible for one to comply with the regulations. Number seven, do not make rules that change too frequently. People need to be given notice and reorder their business so they can comply with the law. And 
Number eight, walk the talk. Don't just tell us what the law is. You be the first one to abide by the law and we shall follow you. I think these are fair expectations. Now, the law moved again from procedural issues to the natural rights. Let us look at how it then moved on to the natural rights as advanced by John Finnis. Before we go deeper into what Finnis advocates, let us recap. The first set of our jurists, uh, St. Augustine, St. Thomas, basically are advocating that for us to understand what the law is before we obey it, let's use the standard of God's law. And um, Lon Fuller says, let's not look at God. Let's look at the law internally. The law must have a procedural way of it being brought to existence. So let's look at that. How it is brought into existence is what determines whether we should obey it or not. And this was in response to um, the Nazi movement. Now, Finnis says, if we look at the law from what the state or the legislature does, we are missing it. Let's look at the law from those who should obey it. I, I hope it makes sense now. The first ones are saying, let's look at God and the law. Let's use that standard. This one is saying, this is Lon Fuller. Let's look at how it is made. The procedure of coming up with the law. That's what is going to determine whether we should obey it or not. Now Finnis says, there are certain rights that we cannot derogate from. Rights that cannot be reduced. Rights that cannot be limited. These are basic goods. There is no need for a constitution. These are there. Every person has these rights. And what are some of these rights? Hmm. You're going to find them very interesting. This is what Finnis says. Right number one. Not to be deprived of life. Not to be deprived of life as a different means to an end. This, I believe, all other constitutions, whether written or unwritten, these are inco incorporated into most constitutions. The right to life is basic. People must have a life and they must use the life so as to ensure that the quality of their lives improves. Is this a fair one? Number two, this is another natural right. He says not to be deprived in the course of factual communication. Not to be deprived in the course of factual communication. This is basically put in our modern kind of communication. I would say not to be deprived of information. Not to be deprived of information and even to engage in the process of communication. We must have those freedoms, number one, of speech and freedom of information. Information must be given to all if it is public and it is information that should help all. No one should find themselves in a situation whereby there is information that is given according to race, tribe, and ethnical origins. You're going to hear that food is being distributed, but it has been distributed to these types of people, to this political party, to people from this region. Such is a right to every person, as long as they are public funds, by the way. And see, not to be condemned upon judges, charges which are known to be false. Now, remember we said it is the responsibility of the judiciary to make sure that it delivers on both substantive and procedural justice. It must defend the human rights and it must defend the rule of law. So these are some things that are already in our constitution. And Finnis is simply saying these are natural rights. Any law that takes away a natural right, the right to be heard, should not be a law. The right to appear before a court and state your case should not be a law. It must not derogate from that. It must not deny me that right. It is a fundamental right. D, at number four, not to be denied procreative capacity. This is the right to make children. Doesn't the Bible say be fruitful and multiply? So everyone must be given that right to procreate. Now, um, the laws have gone beyond that. People are not necessarily 
uh, looking at um, homogeneous uh, relations anymore. They are now looking at homosexual relations. So in a sense, um, in the international community, where homosexual relations are now uh, thriving. Now, according to Finnis, it still applies. Those who are in homosexual relations must still be given the right to procreate, have children. I don't know how it will work, how it will go, but they say, they say it should be a right. No one should take it away from them if we to apply the law as it is today, as a naturalist. But I'm sure the likes of St. Augustine and the likes of St. Thomas would have said it is against the will of God. It is against Lex Divina. It is against Lex Eterna. Therefore, even though Lex Temporalis and Lex Humana have decided this is the law, this is Lex Inusta. It is unjust. So, do away with it. And at number five, to be accorded respectful consideration in any assessment of common good. Respectful consideration. That is clear. Human dignity. Human dignity is a basic right in the assessment of a common good. And even this human dignity goes beyond, um, the, you know, you know I would want to even stretch it and say, it, it is not just the equality of the law, but equality before the law. Equality before the law is just in the execution of justice, but equality even in our proceedings. Let everything speak to a respectful consideration. Whether it be it is a consideration in terms of price, let prices be given in a way that breeds, brings about equality. There must be an equality. Whether we agree with these uh, natural rights or not, that's something else. I'll leave that to you. But uh, personally, I, I think Finnis is coming from a position whereby people want to say, as we obey the laws, it must be a give and take. There are some areas where the law should simply not encroach. There are some areas where the law should not come in. There are some untouchables. So if people are to obey the law, what Finnis is simply saying, number one, the law should not threaten their lives. Number two, the law should not be deemed to be treating them discriminatingly. So it must not discriminate. As far as information is concerned, as far as rights and privileges are concerned, let them be known and shared across the, 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 the spectrum. Number three, no one should be um, charged and condemned without a fair trial based on falsehood. We should not have a criminal system that victimizes people. So when people begin to see that the criminal system is biased, they cease to obey it. They cease to comply. And if it is going to deny them certain comforts, you are not, you, you, you know, when you talk about um, the right to procreate, it, it's so easy for us to, to rubbish this and think about it in, a, in an abstract sense. But at the time that you wrote, I'm imagining um, you know, there are black people used to live in hostels. Even though you were a married man, your wife could not be allowed to come and visit. So under those circumstances, these are procreative rights. That someone would say, what kind of a law confines my wife to the bandulands and my wife cannot come and be with me in town? Because even though I'm a married man, I'm supposed to live in a hostel. These are some of the things that he's talking about. And surely... We, we, we need to look at these and interrogate them. Now, all these are the thoughts of the naturalists. We are not going to dwell much on them because it's not a course in jurisprudence. But now we want to flip the coin and look at what the positivists have to say before we move on. Having looked at the school of naturalists, you know, um, panaceas actually they date back to the Old Testament. So the positivists are going to find themselves left-footed because they now have to give a response. They, 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 they are not the ones who develop the argument. They are simply responding to what the naturalists uh, have already put forward. Now, uh, Jay Gardner, in uh, the American Journal of Jurisprudence in 2001, put it this way. She simply says, um, in any legal system, what we need to appreciate is that the law depends on its sources, not on its merit. 
the law is made by man. If it is not made, it is not law. So this is where now the, the likes of um, St. Augustine and St. Thomas, when they refer to Lex Divina and Lex Eterna, and uh, Lex Natural, I mean, yes, Lex Divina and Lex Eterna, the, the issue now becomes um, these are not going to be laws. Because how do we say the law that was given at Sinai is the law? Because we cannot say God made it. The next question will be, where is God and who is God? You, 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 I, I know it sounds like a bit um, uh, blasphemous for me to say this, but I, I'm preparing you for such arguments. So for you to say God said so, the, the, the next question they will ask is, which God? You know, we, we have people who do not hold the same faiths. So they simply say, as far as the law is concerned, it can only be made by the legislature or the judges. Or lastly, it can be an issue of custom. So if it is not in an act or in an instrument, it is not the law. If it, is, if it cannot be found in a judgment that has been handed down by a court, it is not the law. Number three, number three if it is not a custom, it is not the law. And for the issues that you want to look at, remember the four determiners of a custom, those should apply. So if it does not cover any of those, it is not a law. This is what they simply say. So the, the moral aesthetics of, of, of the law and the economical inconveniences it brings are neither here nor there. So let's go back to that issue. The fact that the consumer price index says a family must have upwards of $500. The fact that you are earning $250 does not have any bearing on what the tax is. The tax is the law as it is gazetted. You pay it where you get the money from. That is not the business of the law. You pay. That is what the law is. Because when we go in this kind of uh, an approach, we need to appreciate that people are going to view the law through the lens of conscience. We're going to be using our emotions. I don't feel like it. You know, it is not fair. It is, it is inhumane. It's not an issue of what is your natural right, what you feel like you should remain holding in your hands. No, 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 no. It's not what you remain holding. It is what the law is in terms of what has been posited by legislature, the judge, or by custom. Now, this is what Bentham and Austin say. These were some of the, 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 the leading um, uh, legal minds of the 17th, 18th century. They simply said, what the naturalists are simply trying to argue for is that whosoever does not feel like they like the law, they should just lean on their conscience and say, it, it is inconscionable. Therefore, it is not the law. So you cannot have a situation where everyone digs into their conscience to define what the law is. Some of us don't even have a conscience. So what are we going to use in order to, to determine what the law is and what the law is not? And Austin actually goes a step further and says, you can come here and tell us about your conscience. Go all the way to court. And the courts back then, of course, there was the, 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 the hangman. The court will still hang you with your conscience. You are still going to say, this I will not do, but you will still be hung. Go to the book, uh, book of Daniel. I think, let me give you a good example. Yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, yeah. Let's go to the book of Daniel. The three Hebrew boys. You have a situation whereby the, the laws of the land have decided, uh, the, the legislature of the day that was in Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, has enacted a law, a law that violated religious rights. And he simply said, everyone should now bow down before this idol in the plain of Dura. If you do not bow down below, before this idol, I'll throw you into the flames. And it was clear. It was well known. It was published. And there was even a herald to play a symphony to play before this whole thing happened. Now, these gentlemen, they say, no, 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 no. We will not do it. It is against our religious rights. So what happens where the legislature begins to dictate on religious norms? infringe on religious rights when it has done so even though it is a bad law you can assert your religious rights but you are still going to go into the fire 
and they were thrown into the fire providentially. There was a fourth man to join them in the fire. But as Austin puts it, you are going to be singing your hymns as you go into the fire. That is the law. That's how it works. It is not about conscience. It is not about aesthetics. It is not about morality. The issue is we need to look at who has posited the law. Of course, of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that unjust laws are just because they have been legislated. No, 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 no. They, they, they are unjust. They should, of course, be visited. They should be reviewed. It does not necessarily mean um, activism has no place because the laws have been uh, enacted. They've been legislated. No, 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 no. They have been legislated, but activism still has a place. So activism does not necessarily say the law is not the law. Activism says, yes, this is the law, but it is bad law. It needs to be reviewed. It needs to be changed. And this is where now at question number five, we're going to be looking at how we are going to change the law. These uh, gentlemen go on to even argue and they say, as far as the law is concerned, the law is basically commands of the legislature which are backed by threats. So people obey the law because they fear the coercive nature of the law, the coercive arm of the law. It will force them to comply. But is this always the case? No, no, no. no. This is where now the likes of St. Thomas go on and say, no, the law is not always coercive. It can also give certain rights. It is a, a law that is good. That's why they call it Lex Humana. And Professor Hart goes on to say, no, 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 the law is not always a threat. It is not always a threat. The law also gives certain rights. And when we've already looked at the freedoms that come with the law. So the law as it is, it is posited, but not all laws are bad. We cannot have a situation where we want to believe and behave as if there is no law. We're going to sink into anarchy. And that's what we're going to sink into. Let's accept that we need to change the laws. We need to improve them. But the laws are not entirely bad. And the threat does not always lead to compliance. Some people would obey the law because they're looking at the bigger picture. They're saying we need systems in place that are going to govern conduct. And they'll say, even though this one is, um, is not a perfect fit, I will still comply for the sake of the other laws which are good so that they too do not go down the drain along with the bad law. When we violate one law because we are condemning it, we end up condemning the entire system. You'd rather have a situation whereby you change the system, I mean you change the laws, before you do away with the system. Change the laws before you do away with the system. I hope this is clear. Now, with um, the debate between the naturalists and the positivists going on. Now, the, the, the positivists did not anticipate that the naturalists are going to come back at them and, and hit them and say, you know, um, that would mean as far as the law is concerned, it remains a mechanical thing. You, you do not have any other uh, mechanism that accounts for why people would obey the law. Because some people do not do so out of fear. Uh, there, there are people who do so because they, 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 they value, they, they, they value um, authority. You know, yeah, actually, actually um, you, you're going to find that most um, systems of, uh, I mean, religious systems predominantly, the, this is why I was at uh, Karl Marx or Lenin, I can't remember, in your history, who, who said um, religion is an opium that dulls the senses of the masses. So you're going to find that most people who are steeped in religion, they're generally law-abiding, not because they fear anything, not because they, they, they are under any threat. It, it doesn't always follow that people are operating from a threat perspective. And number two, it doesn't also follow, um, just like Augustine had uh, gone that way and Austin went that way as well, that there will always be a command for the laws to, to, to take place. Now, I, I did mention this earlier, 
Section 134 is already an example where one is going to find themselves making subordinate legislation. Um, and that is in terms of the law. The freedom to contract, enter into contracts, that is a, a legal issue. And uh, you're going to find a situation where even the licenses that were, were raised as some of the legal transactions one will go into, these are acts that are lawful that one cannot then say um, they, they are not law because they, they do not have a threat that backs them. So people are going to do these things because they, 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 they are just rule abiding. And this is the other thing that Prof Hart also brings to, to mind. He says, you know, as if to concede to naturalists that people actually give recognition to a state, they give recognition to authority. And because they recognize authority, they are going to comply, not out of fear or censure from the state, but because they have recognized that these are our leaders. We have put them in place so that they can um, make laws for us in our behalf for the good of peace, order, and good governance. So because of that, people are going to comply. So it is not always an issue of enforcement of the law. And um, so the... The stance that uh, Prof. Maduku takes with all due respect is, is rather hard line, you know. It, it is not the enforceability because some of those things are going to be the law whether they're enforced or not. I hope it makes sense. So they are going to be the law because the, the, the law has an internal morality to it that, you know, besides the way it is couched, it, it is couched in an imperative tone. You shall do this, you will do this, you will do this. Yes, it already compels you to obey. You know, it compels you to, to comply. But there are people who oblige, regardless of the enforcement element. So it cannot be the enforcement only. But there's the recognition that people give. And um, Finis also comes back. And he gives four more um, uh, types of uh, scenarios that lead to an, an obedience. People, you, you know obeying the law without the threat. And um, in some cases, of course, there is the threat element. And the first one he identifies, he says, there's a sanction-based obligation. This was the basic one. That's where your Bentham and your Austins come in, where the state threatens. You do this, if you don't do this, punish you. So people do it out of fear. They don't understand. They simply do it. So he accepts that to say, this is the reason why people obey and this is why others are going to obey. Because if you don't obey, we'll arrest you and we'll throw you in prison. Number two, he says there's an intrasystemic obligation. What is the intrasystemic obligation? The law is designed and drafted in such a manner that it demands obedience from the citizen, hence compelling him or her to do so. So that the way it is, it will not compel you by the way it will talk to you. It, it talks in such a way that it, it, it doesn't give you much options of saying no. <laughs> there, there isn't much, much debate about it. And then number three, there's the moral obligation. The citizen has an inner drive that stems from one's conscience to abide with the laws because it is the right thing to do. So the, this is where... Uh, if you go back to what St. Augustine was saying, St. Augustine was saying, in other words, since you have an inner drive, you, you love the Lord. You, you, you are led by Lex Eterna, Lex Divina, Lex Naturalis, because you love the Lord so much. This is what drives you. Your love for the Lord gives you that inner drive. You are aspiring for that which is already above the mundane. So you're not going to find yourself bogged down with all these other things. You have an inner drive. That inner drive to do the right thing is what will always keep you doing the right thing. Even though others are doing the wrong thing, you will still do the right thing. So this has nothing to do with threat. It has nothing to do with compliance. I mean, with um, um, enforcement of the law. And then number four, there's the distinct coll collateral moral obligation. Now on a balance of probabilities, the trade-off of rebellion outweighs obedience, resulting in people obeying bad laws as well. So you want to say, um, there are some people, this is where uh, St. Thomas, 
now says, people would say, if I disobey, I might crush the whole program. Is it worth it? So for the sake of the greater good, I am going to obey the laws. Now, as we obey these laws, we want to then be alive to other theories that affect the laws and also go on and investigate them. Some of these theories that um, also come into play are sort of the Marxist theories. Uh, you must have done this in your Form 2 history. I'm taking you back into history now. The Marxist theory simply says the law is a class struggle between the haves and the have notes. What is happening is that the laws are designed to protect the bourgeoisie, <laughs> those who are well-to-do. And where do we find the bourgeoisie? In parliament, in government, in corporates. So because those who own companies are already in the legislatures, do you think they are going to legislate in favor of the employees? So you're going to find that, um, this is what I've noticed, uh, many a time you're going to find uh, that those who are in the farming sector, their salaries are usually lower than those that are in industry. Why is that so? The reason is basic. Some of those people have no representation there. So the laws are meant to protect those who are well-to-do. So now, at the end of the day, why would such a person obey? Because they are being held or coerced. And the sanction is no longer a threat of force. It is a financial or an economic sanction. If you do not comply, you are fired. If you do not comply, your contract is not renewed. If you do not comply, you are going to be transferred. So these kind of mitigatory uh, measures that um, come up, you know, this is where now the employer is going to exert some force, which is not incarceration but financial force. And the lecturer is going to enforce the same force. If you don't read my notes, you will fail. If you don't write my tests, you will fail. Such is the law. Why do people com comply? Because they know there is some threat of some, sort, of some sort. Please read into the Marxist theory. But now, without much ado, I want us to roll over to how we can change the laws so that we can wrap up and move on to the next section. We are not always going to be happy with the laws. This is a fact of life. We are not always going to be happy with them. We may find a situation where we want them changed. I'm not going to spend much time on these ones. I'm just going to breeze through and say, um, number one, petition the legislation. Write a letter to express your displeasure on any law that is unlawful or uh, any law that infringes upon your rights. And that uh, this is um, in connection with illegalities and not just inconveniences. Um, it, it would be difficult for you to seek a change because the law is a nuisance. It causes a discomfort. But um, you may get greater audience where the law is um, infringing on a right. And um, should you not get audience with the legislation, because that is the first place, how do you get the attention of the legislation? You, first of all, petition and you, you write and uh, you engage the legislature. Whenever there are those forums where the law is being discussed, you raise the issues there. I hope the politicians are going to listen and uh, be gifted with speed. <laughs> be gifted with speed. Number two, where you cannot go the route of legislature, which is a bit slow. You approach the court for a declaration of invalidity especially where the law either is ultra-vious with the constitution in terms of the supremacy court um, clause, that would be subsection, I mean, section two, um, the supremacy clause. If, if it is inconsistent with any provision of the constitution, you go there for a declaration of invali invalidity. And uh, if it is a situation where it is also inconsistent with the parent act, it is a statutory instrument, you still go through the same way. It, it, it must be invalidated and it must be brought back and it must always be intravised. So that is the second option that you have at your disposal. Number three, you could have uh, a situation where the legal system has ceased to live up to the claim of being one in terms of the eight-point test. You remember the eight-point test that um, 
uh, Fuller spoke to on the procedural immorality. In, in, in such a situation, um, it might be difficult for you to change the laws. Common sense demands that where the system is the one that has a problem, changing the laws in a bad system does not help because your problem is not the laws, but the system altogether. So when you have to change the system every five years, every nation will have what is known as a plebiscite. Uh, let's not be sophisticated. Elections. Go to the elections, register, vote, and express your opinion. Do you have a right? By virtue of being a citizen and being above 18, you have a right to express an opinion on who governs you, on the system that governs you. If you're not happy with the system, that is what you do. Option number four. When you have decided to exercise your right in a plebiscite, maybe it's high time you cease to be governed and govern yourself. Why don't you run for office yourself? Run for office and you be the change that you want to see. You cause that change. You are busy telling us politicians are corrupt, politicians are stealing our money, politicians are ineffective, politi politicians are slow. Maybe it's because you're not a politician. Become one and let they show, show us what politicians should look like, what they should do. And then at number five, this is how uh, we got independence. Rise up, take up arms, and dethrone the government. Would I recommend this? No. A coup is an unconstitutional means of taking up power. The constitutional means of taking up power is at a plebiscite. You should go and win the right to govern. You cannot usurp it. When you take it by force, chances are you lose it by force. So that, those are the five um, options I think that are available. If you can think of, of some that I may not have covered, please do bring them to mind. But point number one, petition. Number two, approach the court for a declaration of invalidity. Number three, where the system has failed, vote it out. Number four, run for office. And number five, don't stage a coup. Myanmar is already having a problem right now. You know, there is very little that comes out of these coups and, uh, and uh, armed struggles. Maybe I'm a bit of a coward. But as, as I was looking at, usually, um, if you look at the carnage the, 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 that is on, especially in the Arab nations, you ask yourself, the government that is going to come into power, where does it begin? The infrastructural government, I mean, is infrastructural damage that is there as a result of an armed struggle tends to be more retrogressive than progressive. Anyway, that's just my thought. But um, I, I would want us to uh, leave it at that and say, um, how do we change the laws? But uh, before we part ways, remember this. The law is not only concerned with vices. It is not concerned with threatening and enforcing compliance. The law also gives power. Let us just look at this bit before we move on to contract in our next video so that we appreciate what are some of the creatures of the law. What does it give us that we can use at our disposal? In the context of uh, commercial law, business law, the question that still begs an answer is, what is law? Now we have uh, looked at uh, five questions to answer this uh, question as well on what the law is. But um, if I could be allowed to put it this way, I would say that the law is that system which uh, enables the formation of rights and obligations. We may talk about enforceability and all those other issues, but in the context of business law, it is a system uh, that gives birth to rights and obligations. And uh, just for us to appreciate what these rights would mean and what these obligations would mean. Now, where one holds a right, a corresponding obligation immediately arises. Let's use a very simple example. Uh, most of us, we use our mobile phones to, to, to access the internet or even uh, call and even be on social media. Now, should you purchase a, a token 
a data token should i purchase a dot a data token for five united states dollars worth purchasing that uh, data token gives me a certain right the right is for me to access the data that is worth five united states dollars by purchasing that token a corresponding obligation immediately arises on the part of the service provider. Now, the service provider finds oneself with an obligation to ensure that when I connect, I should be able to use that data at the time that I choose to do so. So this is how these rights and obligations basically arise. So members would come in and come into a relationship enter into a contract to form these rights and obligations. Now, on the other hand, you will notice that there are norms. In as much as there can be expectations, it doesn't necessarily mean that every time where there's an expectation, there is an obligation. Now, give an example. When uh, a lady uh, gets to the door and uh, there's a gentleman, It is the norm that the gentleman will get the door for the lady. And uh, it is not out of order for the lady to expect that the gentleman will get the door. And when the gentleman gets the door, voila, you're schooled, man, you've got class. But if the gentleman doesn't get the door, it, it doesn't mean that he had an obligation to do so. It was just a norm. It's a social norm. It's a social expectation. So it doesn't necessarily follow that every lady will have a door uh, being caught for them. And uh, secondly, neither does it mean that every man is always going to get the door. Some men are just going to walk out as if you don't exist. They might actually push you out of the way. So these are not legal norms. All that you can get out of this is that you would have a situation whereby society is going to look at you in um in, in, in a manner that is, uh, you know, uh, you know, telling you that your 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 conduct is uh, not expected. It's not the conduct that is expected by the society. So you you, you may just receive a social sanction uh, as someone who's not schooled, someone who's got lack of taste or class or something like that. But um, as far as rights and obligations are concerned. Rights are those particular rights that can be defended by the court, that you can go to the court for enforcement. Now, um, remember, we, we looked at the positivists and we said the aesthetics of the law are neither here nor there, but it is its content. What is enforceable out of it? That is what we need to look at. So the enforceability that uh, Dr. Matuku raised at the beginning comes to life, it resurrects, there is the enforceability. So the the rights for you to say, I have a right, you want to be sure that you hold the right. Some of us claim to have rights, but we don't even hold them. It, It doesn't always follow that everyone holds a right. For you to hold a right, remember, it 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 might uh call for you to to have um either a personal right or uh either a personal right or um a real right yes yes that's the word i was looking for a personal right or a real right a, a personal right is the right that you are going to own in your personal capacity and it applies against the next individual that is a personal right now for a real right it is a right that when you hold you hold it and the obligation applies to everybody else. So it is a right against the world. A personal right is a right that you hold against one individual. But for you to claim whether you have a personal right or a real right, you want to be sure that when you hold a real right, it is registered as such. And the highest right you can ever hold for a real right, it is in property. Property. This is a right that when you hold No one in the world can infringe on that right. It is a protected right. But when you get into any other contractual agreements, these will lead to legal or personal rights. So you need to be a legal persona. You must have a legal identity 
And this particular identity is what makes you hold these rights. So whether you hold them as an artificial person or a juristic person, you hold both the personal and the legal and, and the real rights, I mean. So Solus University, for example, is a juristic person. It holds the real rights to the property that it owns and operates from. So when a learner or an individual comes to Solus University, it does not follow that you are going to access the university at will, as you are going to find when you get to the gate. Permission is at the discretion of the owner, and his agents can discharge the decision of granting access or denying access. That is what it means. It is an exclusive right. No one can bulldoze. No one can just come in and say, I'm, I'm, I'm coming in because I wish to do so. So when students are on campus, they too would not uh, necessarily um, have that right. It is a restricted right. It is a controlled right. And when you come in as a student, here's the other thing that you do. When you have a right to access someone's property, when you are granted the right to access, you have the right to come in and you have the right to go out as and when you please. But when you come in as a student, you sign away some rights, the right to leave campus as and when you please. You may find that there may be conditions on how you're going to leave the campus. You may have to surrender some um, visitor's pass. You may have to surrender some um, uh, exit pass so that the university would know where you are. Those are some of the rights that you surrender. So the law basically sets up these personal rights and these real rights. So when we hold these rights, we, we, we hold them against those who have an obligation. When we have obligations, we fulfill them to those to whom we are indebted to because they hold a certain right. So what then have we said in brief in terms of the rights and obligations? Now, um, what have we covered so far as far as there's the rights and obligations? Yes, they may be held by individuals. They may be held by artificial persons, juristic persons. Oh, it doesn't matter much who holds these rights. But in recognition that the law brings this into existence, this is what uh, Professor Hart said. This is what uh, Lex Humana advocated for, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. So when these rights come into existence, a relationship is formed. And, and, and we did mention that it, it takes us to our sets, the universal set, where you're going to have the entity being the juristic person, dealing with the customer who is going to be the natural person. As these come into a contract, whether it's a contract of sale or a contract of employment, or it's a contract as a supplier, whatever contract these are going to have. And I would also want to add that even on the artificial person, you may have them deal with other artificial persons, other juristic persons. Now, when they come into a contract, they are exercising their freedom to enter into contracts. This regulation, this relationship, is then regulated in as much as they have rights and obligations between the two of them. It is a, a, a by relationship between the two. Now it becomes tripartite in that the state is going to regulate what will happen in that transaction in as much as these will be left to transact the business on their own. It cannot be done where there is a dispute in terms of the rights. Who has the right? Who has the obligation? Has it been fully discharged? Has it been done properly? you're going to find that you're going to find that either the government coming in, I mean, the state agencies coming in or the judiciary coming in to interpret the contract, or you could have a situation where the legislature even comes up with laws that are going to affect and even uh, regulate conduct in this particular scenario. So these are going to come in and operate within that scope. So there, there is no way we were going to say the laws have created this right. They've given us a, a field in which to operate. The law should make it a point that uh, the judiciary, the legislature, and everyone else stays out. So we're going to find that it is impossible for us to have these relationships because usually they do go bad and they shall go bad. When they do go bad, 
there is a need for us to then go back and say, how then are we going to work around resolving these issues? So when we have these rights that have been conferred upon us, it is only proper at this point that we should move over into contract law and discuss some of the theories that go with contract law. And you're going to find some interesting theories that we're going to look at, contract formation. Uh, do not go away anytime soon. Do call again. We'll be looking at the freedom of contract. What happens in there? We're going to look at the sanctity of contract. We're going to look at the will theory. These are the contracts, uh, the issues that we're going to be looking at as far as contract is concerned in our next couple of videos. As we go our separate ways, be a law-abiding citizen. I remember there is a movie that I played a long time ago, The Law-Abiding Citizen. May you be that citizen, both in this life and in the life to come. May God bless you, may God keep you, and may God sustain you. Blessings and peace. Good day.